My name is Patricia. I'm one of the directors of Startup Brand Newcastle. Uh, and I'll be your host online for the online session today. My colleagues are hosting all the attendees in person. So thank you very much for everyone who's joining us. We've got an amazing panel and uh, I will introduce our, our, our panel speakers in a couple of minutes. Uh, just before we start, um, for those of you who haven't uh, attended our events before, uh, let me introduce Startup Brian. So we are, um, we are a community of entrepreneurs with 5 million members and 600 chapters across the globe, uh, aiming to connect, inspire and educate entrepreneurs. Um, I could say we are the world's largest community, hosting thousands of events across the, across the globe, uh, almost every week, uh, like that one. We had um, entrepreneur speakers such as Jessica Livingstone for Y Combinator, Bill Murray's Google Ventures or Gary Vee. Uh, and today we've got uh, our amazing speakers. So if you're looking for a place to connect, to, to thrive as a tech entrepreneur, um, stay with us. Today's event is the first one that we are kicking off uh, and the following week we, we do have a couple of events uh, in a series of leveling up north so I will tell you a bit more towards the end of the of the event today what what to expect next week so uh, just a couple of house rules uh, we are not going to go for the fire safety uh, that's already been done in the room there but uh, just to say everyone is muted except the speakers uh, during the session if you have any questions and re regarding to anything we are discussing please put them in the chat there will be a QA um, after after to the session and we'll open the floor for, for all the questions so if you've got any please put them in the chat uh, anyone attending in person if you could uh, just I think there is an iPad circulating so you can type in the iPad and I'll see them I'll be monitoring that during the q a um, before we kick off uh, I'd like to um, introduce and formally introduce our sponsor seed legals they support our community as we grow and we are a very young chapter we've got Anthony, founder of Seed Legals, today with us. So it's a great pleasure to, to see. I keep hearing a lot of good feedback from, from the founders when I engage with them, both with uh, from our community, but also from the founders that I know from the community in, in London. And they always uh, praise Seed Legals for how effective, how fast they are. Uh, what Seed Legals do, so that's an innovative funding service to help funders uh, raise money from one of investments to a full funding round or the top ups. Um, and they are right now the largest uh, closer of funding runs in the UK. So um, the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, 35,000 startups and probably counting more uh, SMEs, investors that use Seed Legals, 800 million plus raised. So uh, a complete game changer, I think, in the industry for, for the early funding. You will have an opportunity to learn more about them as well as about uh, UKBA um, A today and, uh, and, and the angel investing as well and an investment readiness from the panel speakers. So with that said, um, let's, let's get started. I'd like to start with asking um, our guests to tell a few words about themselves, how they support entrepreneurs. And that's, that's, that's the first question, Anthony, over to you. So hello, thank you. Thanks for the very nice intro. I'm Anthony Rose, founder and CEO at Seed Legals. We're about 160 people now. Uh, one in six of all early stage funding rounds is on Seed Legals. And our goal is that we're the operating system of your business. So um, when we started Seed Legals, uh, I thought that people were looking for legal agreements. But then I realized zero people wake up in the morning and go, I want a legal agreement. No, you want funding, you want to hire somebody, you want to give your team some share options and so can we create a platform that helps you every step of the way and every step of the way includes of course the legal contracts but also is uh, webinars articles data to show you what's market and basically jump into the seed legals club so to speak to see everything you need 
to grow your business and to know what to do. So if you are planning a funding round or SEIS or uh, any of the other things to grow your business, head over to Seed Legals and we are delighted to help. And on this call, I think you, you, you're you sending uh, questions as well. So whatever you want to know, hit us up and we'll try and answer them. Thank you. Amazing, thank you very much. Uh, Roderick, could you could you tell us about yourself and uh, UK Business Angel Angels Association, your uh, managing director, and you do a lot, so over to you. Yeah, sure. So, um, hi, uh, so I'm Roderick Beer, MD at UKBA, uh, 17 or so years in, in that kind of seed angel investing world. Uh, I now run up, run the, the UK Business Angel Association. We're a not-for-profit trade body for seed stage investing, really. So we look after about 220 organizations across the country, ranging from angel groups, big and small, to VC funds, big and small, and family offices, etc. online platforms, various seed legals and members of ours, of course, as well, uh, have been for, for a number of years. Uh, and our job as a trade body is to help build, connect, and grow that seed stage, seed pre-seed, series A stage, investment ecosystem in the UK. So we've lots of work around education for bringing new investors into the world, lots of education about to founders about how to raise from investors. We also work a lot around solving the industry's challenges around diversity, around regional disparity, so improving access to finance around the outside of the kind of London, Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, we work a lot around um, supporting that educational piece as well, really big for us. Um, I think all told, our members invest about 2.2 billion every year into UK-based businesses. So quite a broad and quite a supportive and collaborative group. Amazing. Thank you. Shakib, um, last but not least, um, well, I, I've, I've known you <laughs> for, for a few years, uh, but I think you're, you, you're the, the, the best person to say a few words about uh, immense work that you do uh, for yeah. entrepreneurs working with them. Yeah. So my perspective really is around the technology element of entrepreneurship, though I do get involved in the legal financial stuff that the other speakers are, are, are good at. So for me, it's I've, yeah, so I learned on punch cards. So every iteration is new. And now we're looking at NFTs and Web3 and all this other stuff. So what I find amazing is, is the, 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 the number of technologies that come out and the number of ways to approach technology. And, and I, I chair the BCS, the British Computer Society's Entrepreneur Group. And part of that role is to make sure we're looking at the best way of developing tech. You know, so my core interest is to teach those who have got no access to resources or mentoring through BCS entrepreneurs and the charity that I've set up called SEED, the Society for Entrepreneurial Education Development, so that we can help develop new businesses. But it's really, you know, that's the SEED end of the business. And then with entrepreneurs succeed with us, we're doing a bit more developing the business and helping with mentoring, looking at the top not, not technology, security, and resilience, team mentoring around making sure they've got the right processes and procedures in place around racy swap, and then uh, business development. And then, you know, supporting the investment readiness uh, piece, but the, the technology end, you know, and the business end, rather than the financial and legal end, like my co-presenters are talking about. So I think it complements uh, very well. And we've got a very strong panel. So all the difficult questions, I'm not sure my questions are very difficult. I always try to kind of put that uh, kind of balance for, for everyone, because we may have people with uh, different uh, awareness of, of how to approach raising investments. Uh, but uh, yeah, if anyone has any specific questions, something bothering them and, and giving the headache, uh, please make sure that you put that in the chat. So, uh, well, let's start with um, maybe defining the um, the um, stages or, you know, the, the seat precede. I think it's kind of like moving a bit sometimes and it's changing. And there is, I think, speaking to the founders, I see that there is some ambiguity, whether, you know, we are a seed stage pre-seed, whether we should go for this or that. Even recently, I had um, a su submission from, from someone who said, like, well, we are Series B. After having a, had a look at that, I, I wasn't so sure. So could I ask you to to say what you think that has changed and and to let's try to define that. Uh, Roderick, could I could I start with you? <laughs> oh, you're, I you're muted there, I can't Rod. see you. 
Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's, a it's a tough one because I'm. Sorry, um, I can I can't hear you. It is it is <laughs> changing all the time. It also depends on where you are in the world. I mean, the US seed is a very different seed to the UK based seed. It's a bit it's far bigger numbers. Um, but I think the way we see it, really, uh, that kind of seed pre seed is anything up to and including your kind of Series A investment round. Really, pre seed typically looks at that kind of friends and family first, early for, uh, angel round, and then seed starts to see a bit more. You know more. You know, maybe raising your your second angel round, you know, three four hundred thousand plus, and actually it goes right into Series A really as well. Um, um, to be honest, but it depends. You know, uh, Bohurst have a very different way of defining between seed and they call it venture and they can growth, etc. And so it does constantly vary. Um, I would generally say um, to try and tie it back to a company in their stage, it's generally pre-profit. Um, it's early revenues, pre-profit uh, or early profits as well. And certainly not uh, nothing nothing uh, significant as yet in terms of a profit or revenue position is what I'd probably call it. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Would that be the same uh, from from your experience? Yeah. So let, let me try and put it differently. So here's the life cycle mm -hmm. of a UK company and how it maps into the question. So our data on seed legal, so that. Uh, uh, founders start by putting a median of £26,000 of their own money into the business first. Why? Because nobody invests just on a PowerPoint. You have to build something. So the next step is at the point you can't fund it yourself anymore, it becomes inefficient to fund it. You know, you holding growth up by funding it yourself, you now want to go and fundraise. And the first thing you might do is a uh, a friends and family round, typically raising 50 or 70,000 pounds from people you know, offering them SEIS or EIS. And then you may do your classic angel round, raising 150 or 200,000 pounds from angel investors. And then you might raise a seed round, which is maybe 500 to 700,000 pounds from angel investors and early stage funds, often with SEIS and EIS. And then you may raise a series A round of maybe a few million pounds from VCs. So, you know, the name is less important, but broadly, if you want to put a name to a stage, the bootstrap round, of course, is people who know you have built very little at that point and they're trusting in you. Angels are where you've got something, a mock-up or something created. You, you may not have it launched yet, and this is giving you money to launch the dream. Seed round is when you're raising from angel investors and so on, and you probably have launched something at that point, and you have got some users, but you don't yet have either product market fit or traction. And a series A round actually is switching gears completely because at this point you've proved that people want what you've got and you, you're raising more, not so much to actually build more stuff or to ship it, but to spend money on advertising and marketing because you've shown at series A that your customer acquisition costs, the cost of finding and bringing on board a new customer is less than the lifetime value. And when you've got that sorted and suddenly you now know words like uh, or acronyms like CAC and LTV and they roll off your tongue like uh, the weather for tomorrow. And now, um, which would have been alien concepts before, and now when the VC says, what's your CAC and what's your LTV? You don't go, dude, what planet are you from? You go, yes, my, my customer acquisition cost for pay-per-click is 30 pounds and my lifetime value in year one is 500 pounds and that's why i'm raising three million pounds to build my marketing and ad team and give lots of your money to uh, facebook and to google to buy advertising because i make more from a customer than i spend acquiring it which is vastly different to your uh, discussion with an angel investor which is thank you for your ten thousand uh, pound investment which i'll use to build stuff to see if anyone wants it yeah so that was your primer on each stage of funding rounds yeah and what, what what's the um, uh what's hard uh uh, I mean, mo mo what's the most common round that uh, your clients at Seed Legals uh, come? Is it Seed or Pre-Seed? Yeah, so I would. So people hop on Seed Legals right at the earlier stage. So you start by two founders get together or three or whatever, and they do their founder agreements, and then some will 
progress and do a bootstrap round. But broadly, there's a funnel. So each year, there are a lot more early stage rounds done than later stage. Some companies never make it to later stage. So there might be 10,000 or 5,000 funding rounds a year from angel investors, but there might only be 500 Series A rounds a year in the UK. So uh, most seed legals uh, users are on this sort of angel round through to seed round. And as companies grow on us, then it gets later stage as well. But certainly it's, you know, your classic £150,000 SEIS round is the thing we see most. And that's also because that's the thing that's most done. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Roderick, do you see the difference between the sectors and types of companies and the way the, the length uh, that it takes the journey towards the investments? Yeah, we do, uh, and it's actually quite a, a known challenge. It's uh, often jokingly, you know, for instance, hard tech, which is kind of physical devices or technology. It's called hard tech because it's quite hard to raise for and grow and build and scale the business on it. Um, so there are differences. Um, sectors more money to get a company from A to B, life sciences, medical devices, research and technology intensive businesses that require a lot of funding often take more funding and more time to get to different milestones to grow and scale. So we do see that, absolutely. Um, those operating in B2B, B2B SaaS, uh, at which, which C Legal is indeed in its own right, um, um, does, does, does incredibly well from, the, from an investment perspective because clean, fast growth metrics that they can justify and show. So companies which have more of a physical research-led approach to having to, to build and grow IP from which to, to then uh, grow a business often tend to have a bit more, they need more money because it takes a lot longer for them to get any commercial traction. Um, so we do see that quite a bit. Um, there's another, some additional challenges, those in that kind of space is often the founders are quite technical. So they really understand their IP. They really understand how to build and grow and, you know, I, great IP, great technology, but not necessarily the, the commercials of the business. They're not natural presenters. They don't understand as well about driving a company towards commercialization. They're more about driving the technology to being more effective. So there are often some, some key challenges in there. Um, um, which is interesting because we've got things like deep tech, we might have heard of, you know, AI, machine learning, et cetera, quantum, the really, really super exciting sectors globally. And the UK is uniquely strongly positioned in the, on that global scale to really perform very well within that sector. But actually, there's not quite enough funding going in there because they need more money, more time to actually find commercial applications for these technologies. So there's definitely a, a difference depending on what you're up to. Yes, thank you. Sh Shakib, you probably have experience uh, <laughs> working with them and preparing them uh, from, from that side. So uh, yeah. would you would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. So so the journey I try to encourage is, is slightly simpler and it's not based on money, but mainly what they're building is, you know, we've got what I like to do is get them to do their ideation piece as a uh, idea to plan and, and think about what they're trying to do, you know, and then plan to uh, uh, peer, uh, proof of concept, proof of value, proof of market before they start spending money and executing on technology. You know, one of the biggest reasons why technology, especially, you know, hard tech or anything else, there's a lot of R&D costs and building costs. But if they haven't done their problem solution fit, you know, correctly, then how are they going to do product market fit? And this is what happens. They, they start marketing something that they haven't developed properly or thought about properly, and then try to re-engineer bits. And this is where it, it goes, you know, causes a number of issues because it doubles the costs and, and slows everything down. So when it start, when you start looking at um, AI, ML, uh, quantum, so I've had several conversations with the universities around quantum, putting on a quantum startup program or something. It's still early days, so there's not a lot of knowledge in that space. I do have a, a consortium that we're building around five data centers where we're using AI and ML and a big data and, and creating data lakes. So this is really early stage stuff, you know, because the cost of building some of these, you know, AI solutions is huge. And it's a fast moving area, you know, AI means things differently today than it did 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Now, AI is a little bit more intelligent than ML, but it's not really artificial intelligence as we see it on Star Trek or something where it talks to you and it thinks and it makes decisions. We're light years away from all of that. Yeah. So AI is really unless you're at the very top end, you know, it's very kind of uh, more automated and more statistical yeah. type of uh, AI than, than AI should be. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, I'll have a question later on to you regarding the MVP building and what's enough, what's not enough, and, and yeah, but um, Roderick, one, one more question with regards to angel investing. Um, when to use an angel investor? I mean, usually there is there is that thinking that that's the early stage and later yeah. on rather a VC. Um, so, so yes, you, you're already... <laughs> Yeah, so um, so angels, when, when, when do you use them? Well, typically, so angels, um, they invest an average of twenty five to £50,000 each individually into a business. And they invest into rounds ranging from size from 150k, as Anthony pointed out, right up to and including, you know, way beyond one and a half, two million pounds. In fact, most investors, when they invest in a business, will have rights to allow them to reinvest at different rounds. So they will be constantly topping up their, their shareholding for many, many years. Um, but when in, when angels are actually particularly the, the, the main source of funding is generally at the early stages, they first come in when a company really has some level of um, independently verified commercial. So it doesn't have to be ideally some sales or some pilots or something it doesn't necessarily have to be that. It could be you know having someone really experienced in the industry joining their board. It could be attendance of a good, well-regarded accelerator program, which is ju it just some indication that someone independent who understands the industry has said, you know what, what they are doing is really exciting and we can see how this could really work out. That's when angels can typically get involved. They won't do it at idea stage. That's why friends and family and your own founders come to play. But they, the minute you start to have a bit of an MVP, a minimum viable product and a, some, some nice early proof points that you've got something interesting, that's when angels will typically yeah. write checks. They are by far... The, the the most uh, the largest source of funding out there. There are a lot of seed VCs and growing VCs who invest at that early stages, mm -hmm. but the actual amount deployed is not um, as much compared to angels. But we know every year about 2.2 billion is invested every year by 36,000 individuals by the EIS and SCIS scheme. It's a really big scheme. So there's a lot of individuals investing directly into businesses. Um, angels and angel groups are becoming more sophisticated, more professionalized. There are a number of groups now who have sidecar investment funds, uh, there are also a number of groups who write some significant checks. And so they have been operating and playing in that pre-Series A, Series A stage more and more. 24 Haymarket are yeah. one of the largest angel groups in the UK. They typically invest at about Series A. So they're doing, they're involved in and leading in two to three million pound funding rounds, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. So it does vary, but their absolutely most dominant part is at that 150K up to and including one to 1.5 million. Um, but CVCs and other forms of funding always play a part and are always investing as part of that journey too. Angels don't invest on their own. They're often part of grant funding packages. They'll be part of other VC packages, co-investment funds, regional funds going in alongside them. So they do attract a diff other forms of, of funding to really help increase the amount of money available to a business. Thank you. Uh, well, you mentioned is and CS. Um, C Legals has an excellent track record uh, supporting startups with that. Uh, Anthony, could you could you explain more about the process and maybe share some practical tips? I know you also have some tools to kind of speed up the process. Um, so I, 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 I'm, I'm sure uh, the audience sure. would like to hear about that. So uh, if you're a UK taxpayer and an investor, also known as an angel investor, then uh, there's a fantastic initiative from the UK government that says if you invest in a qualifying startup, you can write off, deduct 50% of your uh, investment from your tax bill for this year or the last tax year. And if you keep your shares for three years, you pay no capital gains tax. And if the company goes bang, then you can write off your in investment. So it hugely de-risks the uh, investment and as a result individuals investing in getting their SEIS or EIS tax benefits uh, fuel as Rod said the early stage UK ecosystem I think about 80 percent of all early stage funding for less than 500,000 pound rounds are angel investors with looking for these tax deductions so if you're a startup you want to tell investors we can offer you these tax deductions because you'll get you'll find yourself way more investable if you're doing a crowd round it's almost impossible to do a crowd round if you don't offer that and to angel investors it's often the difference between i'm in and call me when you've got your seis so how do you go about and do this so 
there is something that the government offers called SEIS Advance Assurance. So you write to HMRC and you get an approval to go. You can tell your investors that you will qualify for this. Now, this isn't legally required. You don't need to have it. It's kind of just a, a letter of comfort for the investors that many investors now ask companies to do it. So you probably want to do that before you go talk to too many investors because otherwise they just say come back when you've got it and you can do this on seed legals and we think something like one in three of all SEIS applications in the UK is now done through seed legals these days HMRC are amazingly quick they used to take like six to eight weeks it's now like a week to respond or thereabouts which is fantastic and then when you do your funding round, you have to take care that you do things in a particular order and you don't give your investors preference shares or other things that will have them lose their SEIS. And after the funding round, you do what's called SEIS or EIS compliance, which is where you write to HMRC and they give you a special code that gets given to the investor and they can then send that to the accountant and claim their tax deduction. And you can do that bit on seed legals as well. So we've kind of automated all of the steps to make it really easy for a founder, you know, to tick the boxes and be able to reliably give their investor uh, their deductions. Just, just on EIS and SEIS, as a founder, it's very hard for you not to tax break, uh, but it's incredibly important. Although it's a tax break that's kind of given to the founder, it's a benefit to the investor. Um, and so much so, in fact, that I think 98% of angels invest when they're using EIS or SEIS. So if you're not, if you don't get EIS or SES, you don't go through the process with Seed Legals that Anthony's outlined, you are going to really struggle to get any investor engagement. Um, angel investing, just to, to make the point, it's not about the tax break, it's about great returns on great businesses, but the tax break is so good. It is internationally recognised as a, as a phenomenal break and a real catalyst for the, for the advancement of the UK's ecosystem. Um, it is so strong that it's, it, investors would be crazy not to use it if they can. That's right. And investors see many startups. So if, you know, eight of them are offering a tax break and two of them don't, then they'll go, dude, I've doubled my return by going for the one on the back tax break. Uh, thank you. Call me when you've got the tax break. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so on, on the EIS, although it's, it does affect angels, um, it's less of an effect for, for seed VCs. EIS funds, SEIS funds, there are now funds designed for that tax break as well. But a VC structure, the GPLP structure, doesn't the, 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 they don't care about the tax break. It doesn't really affect them. They, they can't benefit from it as well. And they tend to be more international too, so they don't need to worry about it too much. So when you get to that later stages, it's it's not not, not a bigger problem. But at early stages, you should go and get SEIS or EIS yeah. eligibility and advance assurance. Um, so so let's not talk about you know the, the process uh, of uh, preparing for investment, both from the perspective of you know, preparing before, uh, you know, talking to, to investors or talking to seed legals, but also, uh, you know, while, while talking. Um, I would like to know if there are any specific things that founders very often overlook. So at that preparation stage, uh, when building an MVP, Shakib, what do you think when you, when you uh, engage with the founders, uh, the, the common sort of rookie mistakes where they think like, are we ready? And they are not. And then we'll uh, hand over to, to Anthony and Roderick. Yeah, yeah. So, so just before we go into that, so one of the things around find your business angel or your early investors, You've got to make sure they're the right people. Are they subject matter experts in the area that you're in, or they're just at the at the edges? So, and that also depends on the team. So, when you start looking at MVP, you're looking at the team. Have they got the skills, the time, the money, and the uh, the knowledge to take it take it forward? Yeah. So, when they look for investors, they should really try to understand and build relationships with those business angels to make sure that they're the right people to help them, because there could be a number of things that they they may be specialized in, you know, whether a technology business angel or a marketing business angel, and they will help simplify that, that uh, business development journey. When it comes to looking at MVP, you know, cybersecurity is one of the biggest things, you know, you've got GDPR, you've got so many of these compliance things. So where are you sitting in the, in the kind of uh, technology, you know, and where, what stack are you going to use? And, you know, if you start using, you know, PHP or Laravel or some of the other open technologies and there's a, a there's a challenge to the cyber security side of things or using the ipm you know open source stack and there's a cost to that and the knowledge you know that you've got to acquire better skilled people and pay more 
So before you even start developing, developing an, an MVP, you've got to look at what's going to happen in the future. How many times have we seen an MVP being built that needs to be replaced once they've raised the funds? Because it's put together to illustrate something, which is fine. You know, that's fine. You've got a model and you've got a proof of concept. But, you know, you can't go commercially. It's, oh, we just have to do this to go get, get it commercial. And it's not the case. It's got to be scalable. So, you know, is it using cloud technologies? What cloud technologies? You know, what's the security layer? You know, who's developing it? What's the team mix? You know, and if you're and if you haven't done your kind of solutions architecture well enough, or your business analysis to make sure you've got the right customer persona and the right kind of uh, commercial piece, then what you're building isn't going to be resilient. And MVP really means minimal viable product. That means what is that? what good looks like you know is it being able to transact or is it customer acquisition just getting more people on board you know where is uh, the boundary to this mvp because they try and do all of it at the same time and sometimes if you've got a reasonably good investor you can actually build your mvp to get the transactions to get not to say to get the traction to get people on board you know the goal is can i get 10,000 people to join this P uh, proof of concept uh, and um, what are the remarks that come out of it? You know, is it is it usable? You know, instead of trying to commercialize it and then finding out nobody wants to pay for it or people are paying for it, after three months they're leaving. You know, and, and those people say, oh, we'll do a freemium model. You've got to have big pockets for freemium, you know. So, so it's only a few percent, double, so small double-digit percentage of freemium um, businesses actually make money. Thank you. Anthony, so once they come to Sid Legals, uh, what are the most common <laughs> mistakes or things? Sure. So, so nothing to do with Seed Legals, but as a founder, um, I think yeah. that the, the number one mistake that uh, companies make or founders make is they think that the difficulty is building something, but the real difficulty is having uh, consumers want it. And so often founders are technical founders. And so they set about success for them means I'm going to build all this cool stuff. And they go off and they spend months building it and they get people to follow them and get investors to invest in them and they build it and then they ta -da, open the door and actually nobody wants it. So mm -hmm. you wake up in a cold sweat a year into your startup going, oh my God, we've built all this stuff and like the entire proposition, no one wants it. How did I ever think it was a good idea? So what you really want to do is before you get started, you want to really validate it. And so I recommend a book called The Mom Test. And uh, The Mom Test is about, you know, it's called The Mom Test because people might ask their mother, hey, I'm doing this GPS enabled blockchain backed up uh, bicycle lock. Uh, is it a good idea? And your mother goes, I've no idea what you're talking about, but my son is so clever. Of course, it's a good idea. And so the idea is you want to find the real audience and then not ask them, is it a good idea? You say, have you ever looked for this product before? How much would you pay for it? Do you, are you aware of any others? And if no one's looked for it, either it's a groundbreaking revolutionary thing, which is fab but unlikely, or actually there's not a real demand for it. It's a vanity project. I think the other thing is when people have got projects that are good for the world, we'd like to reduce food waste or something. We all agree it's a good idea, but have we ever gone off and sought one of this, such a solution ourselves? So we have to be careful to separate out the, we think this is a great, uh, great for humanity, but actually you're going to find it really hard to acquire people to really use it. And if you are satisfied that there really is a need for it, and were you to create it, people would pay or whatever, or use it in the way you imagine, then that's a good point to go off and build it. And now getting to Shakib's point about the minimum viable products, I think in your mind, you should think about I building a one that I'm going to throw away afterwards, like a rocket going into space. You know, there's the, the, the launch uh, the stage and that gets thrown away as the, the thing gets uh, goes on its journey because it's expendable. Or am I building something that I'm going to keep using? And I think the problem that often companies make is they're going to go, great, I'm, my, my first one, I'm going to use Zapier with Airtable and I'm going to link it to Slack and I'm going to uh, link it to some uh, no-code platform. And it's fantastic. In a few weeks of messing around, um, you can get something that sort of works. 
but you know it's going to hit a brick wall in terms of its usability. So if you plan accordingly, I'm going to spend £4,000 or whatever it might be developing this uh, proof of concept, and then I'm going to throw it away and build the proper one. What you want to avoid is two years later still trying to patch more stuff onto it and still it's failing miserably and dying but you're determined to keep going with it um, yeah. on the other hand it would be silly of you to go uh, we're going to not try this quick throwaway one and instead hire eight java developers and spend a year building this java app and only then discover that nobody wants it so build something that you know is going to be expendable to prove the point uh, you might then see how far you can keep going with that while you build the other in in background yes thank you uh, that that also confirms um, some, some. I mean, agrees with some of the experience that I had working with startups. Exactly, <laughs> very often uh, and, it's about launching. Yes, yeah, sorry. And and if I can add one more important thing, I think because founders love building stuff, I think that I, I see building stuff is actually the failure to not have to build stuff. So if you can get people to want. And, and buy your service or use it with you building less, that is good. So that gets to the fake it till you make it, which is the wrong way with Terranos. But if you can, for example, have a, let's say you decided you need to have all this machine learning and AI to match people and recommendations. Actually, all you need to do is build a website that says, you know, what you want to do. And the simplest thing is it sends a message to your email. And when somebody says, I'm looking for X, you go, oh my God, quick Google it respond and then if you if, if people like the service then you go this, this googling is driving me crazy i need to build a better way but what you don't want to do is spend months and years building this fancy ai system for recommendations and turns out no one's using your no product in the first that. place or they satisfied with a way simpler solution i'm looking for photographer well we can use ai to match you with styles and no i'm in portsmouth a photographer in Portsmouth, <laughs> here are three. Give them a call. You know, so so the the way that all approach, isn't it, Anthony? The, the the kind of low fidelity MVP, isn't it? I like that. We've seen that quite a bit. It's a big, 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 exactly. Yeah, to, you know, get those proof points as cheap as possible. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think this is a, a the last minute dot com. They first launched. They had students in the background doing all the research and then sending those offers. You know. It, and, and is it correct? Validation, low fidelity, prove it. So when I talk about proof of concept, it can be a PowerPoint presentation. If you're creating a, 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 a an app to go through some number of um, a slides, why can't you do it in a presentation? And also, when we start talking about proof of market, who's going to buy it? Have you done a survey, 100 customers? Just get out there and ask them questions. And then proof of value, will they pay for it? Yeah. yeah. You know, there's lots of tools that, you know, especially early stage startups should be using is value proposition canvas and the business model canvas, because that's an iterative tool that you do to refine your idea. And I can guarantee the idea that you start with, you know, that, that you, you know, that hooray moment, I've got this great idea to when you start talking to people, it gets changed a thousand times. Yeah. And they've got to understand what, what they're trying to build and what is the customer want. And, and the thing is, you've got to build to market, not market what you build. That's a failure straight away. And every startup should understand, every founder should understand, 90% of business is selling, not buying. So if you can't sell it, why are you spending £90,000 to build a platform to sell it? You know, one of my startups was a, an employment law and wanted to do legal um, kind of um, uh, secretaries and things. And I said, look, you don't need an app. You don't need this. Just get onto LinkedIn. You've got an email. You've got a phone. Just phone a hundred business, a hundred legal firms, and say, "Do you want a legal secretary?" Yeah, and then search on on LinkedIn, find a hundred legal secretaries, and are you looking for change your job? Please send me your CV. You know, yeah. that's how you do it, and you set up a recruitment company on the back of this because the money that you can make will actually pay for the technology. So you're building to market because you've found somewhere in the market that there is a supply and demand piece. You know, and people think, oh, I'll make the demand. You know, it takes companies, you know, on the bleeding edge of technology, you know, millions of pounds and they go lose it because they're think of, thinking of something that doesn't exist that would really benefit society if it did exist.
But on the back of that, you know, people need to pay for it. You know, people still don't recycle. And there's so many recycling programs, you know. So so it, it, it's never a perfect solution. So, you know, low fidelity, talk to customers, uh, iterate, iterate, iterate the idea before you start spending a huge amount of money. Yeah. Um, Rodrick, any questions that um, founders fail to answer, answer in conversations with angel investors? Yeah, I think it's many and varied. I think there's a couple of things. First of all, you need to always be open and honest about where you're at and what you're doing and, and what you're, you know what's happening behind the scenes there because most angels will know if you're trying to pull the wool over their eyes. Um, so being totally open and honest about the risk factors. I mean, there's the angels, they understand that there's going to be a huge number of risks and potential failure points for the business. And they don't want to see that there aren't any, because that would be a real red flag to be honest. They want to see that you know them and that you're thinking about them and constantly seeing how you can reduce them. So I think that's a key thing to think about. Um, I think also having a handle on your financials as well. We often see um, founders, they, they sometimes just outsource a financial forecast, P&L forecast, balance sheet, et cetera, to, uh, to, an invest, to, 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 a, to their accountant and don't actually kind of nail it themselves and get their head around their, the, kind of the core, you know, the core, making sure they really understand the kind of the cash flow implications of the next 12 to 18 months. They need to really know what are the core assumptions behind why they think they're going to get these sales, why they think it's only going to cost them X when, you know, a bit of reality to be attached to that. So I think make sure the founders are a part of that process as well, so they can be more confident around their, that, that discussion around financials. Um, I think also understanding their, the funding journey is crucial. Um, I often see someone who's looking to raise 250,000, which would get us through to break even and or profitability and or through to my series a uh, and it's just not true you know they need a lot more funding a lot more money the reality is that it'll take them a lot longer and, and uh, to get to the kind of profit or revenue levels they think they're going to get to so i think just understanding you know the, the, the milestones that they are likely to get to on certain amounts of money and how much money they need to get to those milestones i think is a key thing that we often see mm -hmm. as, as somewhat and i think also just when and I see a lot of pitches, a lot of pitches, a lot of pitching, and people often don't nail that really key, clear problem solution story at the beginning. You know, they might talk about if they've got a cool clean tech business, they might talk about the problems of the globe's challenges with 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 pollution, which is which is fine, but the globe isn't paying you any bills to solve it. You know, it's who's your actual yeah. customer, what are their key pain points, and how are you solving that? And it's that. What investors want to see is that you're solving a massive, expensive, stressful problem and you're doing it in a low cost and effective and efficient way that's really engaging. And you need to be able to nail that story and get that across. And I think that's often it's a really basic piece, but it's often actually missing. Um, but if you can get that, you'll, you'll grab people's attention straight away. Hmm. Yeah. Antonio, uh, would, you, would you add here? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, and I think they fail to do a, a detailed enough competitor analysis. You know, you can't just do 10 minutes on the internet and see is somebody else selling it. You've got to find out who's actually doing it because it's the businesses that you see are the tip of the iceberg, but there's hidden businesses who are, who are in stealth mode building certain amounts of technology. So do your competitive analysis. And like Rod was saying, you know, how do you protect the business? What's your defensibility? You know, and I like IP based businesses because it gives you a layer of defense, not perfect, but it's still better than nothing. So you've got to make sure that you've got a strong USP. Can you copyright it? Can you patent it? What can you do to defend it? Yeah, and be very realistic. Other people are thinking the same thing at the same time. Yeah, and and sometimes you know we've got this VHS Betamax story. You know, uh, Betamax was better than VHS. VHS won because they had a lower license fee. Yeah, so it all all matters. You know, one of the other challenges I find is that entrepreneurs are looking at. Uh, commodity pricing rather than innovation pricing. So we've got the product price matrix and early enough, you're investing a lot, you've got to have a, 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 a kind of a, a innovation price, which is slightly higher to a commodity price, which is, means it's ubiquitous and everybody can buy it because th that's how you get your income to develop it. And everybody who I sit down say, oh, we'll sell it for a hundred pounds a month. But hold on, you're spending a quarter of a million to get a, tra a 100 pound transaction. But you then need to get a hundred thousand transactions to make it really profitable over three to five years. I don't. I don't understand. You know, the numbers. 
Yeah. So it's yeah. really important that if it's really innovative and it saves money and it, you know, uh, uh, makes a, a business perform better. So they make more money then it should be innovative pricing. So it's a thousand pounds for the first 100, you know, then 800 pounds, then 500 pounds, then 200 pounds. But over a period of two or three years, as it as the product matures and the market matures. I went, to, uh, I went to a presentation a, a few years ago at uh, uh, London School of Economics to a group of MBAs where there were some startups pitching and one of them was a local sort of food delivery company and one of the MBAs said, so, you know, I, I've, I, I understand you, from the pricing you've presented, you lose money on every order and the, the the person said, oh, yes, no, no, we lose money on every order. And that's what fundraising is for. And uh, the business, the MBAs in the room looked incredulously like either there's something seriously wrong with four years of study or this company is not long for this world. And, and in fact, it wasn't long for that world because that uh, doesn't work other than a, a short term CapEx period. But in, in terms of raising investment my starting point is there isn't just one type of investor people invest for different reasons um, and i almost sort of joke about it you know the, the buzzfeedy what type of investor are you and one of them is the the spreadsheet guru so they're going to look at your business plan and they're going to work out your net present value and the future returns and the return on investment and they're going to make an investment based on that and they probably invest a lot in fintech companies for example and then there's the person who wants to hang out out with the cool crowd so if they're going to get early things of your beer or get invited to parties hey if they make a return that's awesome but you know uh, they, they want to be part of it then there's the one which is the wannabe founder themselves so they've got a day job they'd really like to be a founder but by investing in your company then they want to give you advice and then they want to be part of the board and at some point it goes from like having a house guest who you just can't get to leave <laughs> they you 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 want their money you want a bit of their advice but you don't want them to be a, a co-founder yeah. otherwise you'd have looked for a co-founder yeah. and then there's also the same the world which is yes we know that this may not make money but we're in anyway so what you want to do is you want to analyze for each time you talk to an investor what are their motivations and then you want to tell them a story and create the drama and the fear of missing out and why they want to invest and some of them you're going to upsell the 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 esg and the sustainability benefits some of them will be pure numbers some of them will be about changing the world and the purpose and the mission but in all yeah. cases, they're going to be seeing many smart founders coming to them and you need to be the standout <clears throat> amongst them. So, for example, for me, I know nothing about, you know, vegan food, frozen deliveries. But if I see a pitch deck and on a call with the founder, I can name two competitors that they don't know, then that's a serious problem. They haven't done their homework. And uh, if their business plan just doesn't make sense because they in five years will be a FTSE 500 company and grow faster than Twitter with the, for their blockchain company. That's awesome, but statistically unlikely. And if I don't believe those numbers, I'm not going to believe anything else. Or conversely, if the numbers show such a low rate of growth, that investors often call it a hobby company. For you, it's a great idea. You might sell for a few million in a few years, but for me, it's not an investment. You should just go and borrow money from the bank to, to, to pay for it or fund it yourself. So at the end of uh, you know half an hour or an hour with an investor or three minutes for your deck that you're going to send them, which is the average reading time, you want to wow them to get to the next step and ultimately get their investment. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I know we are running out of time. As I, I still have loads of questions, but I wanted to see if there are any questions from the audience before I ask my my last one, because there might be some some more important questions. So please, if there is anyone in the audience that would like to ask a question, I can't see anything in the Q and A. I do see one from Gabriel um, asking for someone to, to mentor, so we will definitely uh, address that. Uh, but I, I don't think it's like a, it's, it, it's, it's a question per, per se. Um, don't have a clear business model yet, so it's, it's, it's more about mentoring, so we, we can take it offline, definitely. Um, 
Any, any questions from the floor? No. Okay. So my last question before we close today, because uh, due diligence is, uh, I, I mean, founders are usually scared of due diligence, but I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, good positive things about it for both sides. And it's always oh, a way to, yes, to, to way straight. But what would you, what would you, uh, what advice would you give founders that um, do, um, are, are looking for investor a, and uh, to to how, how to do that so you do not end up in bed with someone that you didn't want to be in. Yeah, I'm just going to do a good uh, aspect on the on the legal side of things. So I was coming with the more from a DD perspective overall. I would make sure you have as much pre prepared as possible. It is as a founder, it's down to you to drive around through to successful completion. You need lots of you'll be spinning lots of plates and lots of hurting lots of cats to, to invest in your round all at the right time all the same price etc there's lots of challenges around that and so the, the kind of more time it takes you to get things respond to quick investors send them proof of that a copy of this it just slows it all down so i'd recommend you build a bit of a data room and get that as pre-prepared as you can i'd also just really aim to be open and to respond as quickly and efficiently as possible because as an angel and as a start business, there's only so much that they can actually diligence. I mean, there's only so much you actually have and are ready as well. Um, but really, so they're going to be looking at you know really basic personal things about how quick, how effective, how efficient, you know, how well were you actually managing it as part the, the DD process itself is part of due diligence as well. So just bear that in mind, I think. Um, and that's, that's all I'm going to I'm going to add to it as well. Um, Thank you. All right, so I'll hop in. So what happens is, you know, when you uh, have friends and family investing, they, they are uh, not professional investors and they don't know how it works and they know you and they trust you. So they just give you some money with, without doing too much. Hey, we love what you're doing, you know, 10 grand, here you go. But later on, it comes now to your first uh, round with professional investors or a fund. And the fund is going to do due diligence on your company. And the due diligence includes send me a copy of IP assignment from everyone who's worked on the project to show that their intellectual property has been assigned to the company. Show me the employment or contract agreement with everyone. Show me the non-solicitation and non-poaching clauses and then compete clauses show me where the founder share vesting is and if you are deer in the headlights and you don't have those um, and you've never created uh, such contracts then you will either lose your investor or spend weeks or months trying to find that person who worked on your project is now traveling in south america you split up on bad terms and you want them to sign a contract retrospectively assigning their intellectual property to the company it can be a huge disaster so what you want to do is right at the beginning you want to jump onto seed legals if you're a uk irish french company Singapore, Hong Kong as well. You can do these agreements for free. You can do a founder agreement with share vesting. You can do an IP assignment. So a few startups ago, when I got to my first round and my investors wanted copies of these documents, it was well before seed legals. It took me, I think, about three weeks of madly running around, scrunching around in shoe boxes in my cupboard at home to find things, trying to find out who hadn't signed agreements and trying to persuade them to and find them. And my next startup, I now knew about that, it was still before seed legals, and it took me about three days to try and rustle up all these things because I had them, but just, I didn't know where I put them. And with seed legals, yeah. when it was my first round, it took me about 30 minutes to go share 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 this document because they're all in this one place so uh, you know to pick up where rod left off which is where your investors go great for dd please send me these things and if you can go yep what's your email address um, let me send it or let me share it with you on seed legals we're done then they know that you've got your act together. And not only have you satisfied that request, but they're not gonna bother with a bunch of other stuff because they know that you're running your company properly. And if you have open disputes with people and my co-founder left and they're still claiming their shares and they want me to buy their shares for a million pounds, it's like your, your business is uninvestable at that point. So just complete the box ticking exercise almost, which now, you know, zero effort pretty much on seed legals to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. I see one question that popped in. So let's let's try to very briefly. But if uh, if we can take it offline, if it's more kind of uh, you know extensive answer. It's a, so great, SNN, a great question. Yeah. Yes. So let's 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 take who who would like to take that, Anthony? I'll go. So Rick, Tom says, um, so you know, as an angel, yeah. Mm -hmm. As an angel, how would you uh, weight intellectual property against traction? Um, so, you know, would you weight that a company has a patent or has a million users? And I, I, to me, I think the, the answer varies by the segment that you're in. So if you're a university spin out and I'm on, you know, judging panels for multiple university spin outs, spin outs spend years working on complicated things with maths and science and, and, and have patents. So the only thing they've got is intellectual property. On the flip side, you know, what is TikTok or Snap or whatever had when they launched? They had nothing other than lots of users. So depending on the segment, if you are, you know, making a drone AI control software, it's the intellectual property because your business is probably licensing it to somebody else. So it needs to be defended. If you're making a social network, you don't care about anything. But I do think that largely patents are a waste of time unless you're in the spin out sector. You can spend years on patents. I mean, they take like five years to be granted. Uh, I've got 13 patents and I really suggest they're a waste of time. You have about a one in three chance of getting it. And by the time you proudly walk into the office and go, team, we've got the patent. And they go, dude, we stopped doing that like a year ago. <laughs> um, we've changed the method. So for certain segments, the patents are important. But I think for most cases, I would say 95% of all startup funding rounds, it's, it's all about the growth and investing in growth or, or revenue or the team. Team, what do you think? I, I agree. Um, I, I, the IP, your IP is only as valuable as you're able to commercialize it. <clears throat> we have a lot of um, a lot of companies based on evaluations on on the on an independent valuation of their IP, which is not absolute nonsense. You know, it, it could be what we want to see is some level of commercial traction, and traction over and above IP yeah, um, protection, in my view, and traction in itself can be a good barrier to entry as well, because you're take you're, you're, you're chewing up market segment and you're taking ownership of it before someone else can as well. We obviously want to see barriers to entry, and we want to see you know how can people how easily can this be replicated? Who else is doing it? And that comes back to Shaki's point about competitor analysis. But really, proof points traction much more exciting than than IP protection. To be quite honest, um, that aside, life sciences, other things, which are heavy IP, need patents to keep to keep their value, but they still need to have some level of commercial application. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah, yeah I completely agree. You know, if you can't get the sales, then what are you doing? If you can't get the traction, what are you doing? Yeah, if something comes along and says, I've got this traction on this product that, you know, I've been, you know, doing. So how do we scale that? You know, if you get to, you know, 100 customers a week and you've got a small e-commerce solution, so how do we double that? Do we get it on Amazon? Do we get it on this or that? And how do we improve its visibility to the market? And having first uh, mover advantage can be good. Yeah, uh, sometimes it's not. You get somebody that so that can disrupt your business because it's an extension of theirs. But otherwise, traction is everything. Money is everything. Revenue is everything. You know, far more important than investment. If you've got revenue coming in, that proves that it works, and that's what investors want. So it ups the value of the business. Yeah, it makes uh, raising funds easier. Yeah, I, I often say to the founders that your customer is your, uh, you know, best investor. Yeah. So yeah. obviously, um, yes, you, you have to rise, you, you need the money, but very often they're kind of looking like we need an investor. Well, actually, they could go for the customer. And uh, that's, that's something that, that very often is, is forgotten. Um, I know we've, uh, we've actually, <laughs> run out of time we, we we're like three or five minutes um you know uh, after after we should finish so well i would like to thank um the the, the guests uh, thank you for your time thank you uh, that that was a, a great conversation and I, I i wish we could just continue uh because there is a lot to to share i think we we've just scratched the surface um thank you for everyone uh tuning in today um if uh if anyone would have any specific 
questions to follow up to any of the speakers today uh just briefly how could they contact obviously you can contact startup grind we'll pass the contact details uh but uh any 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 other way Seed Legal's page, probably, yes? Yeah, head over to Seed Legal's, hit the web chat. You'll find me on uh, LinkedIn, Anthony Rose. Uh, and uh, you can also hit up uh, anthony at seedlegals.com if you want to drop me an email. Yeah, check out um, ukba.org.uk. We've got a list of our members. Are, we've got, I think it's probably the most comprehensive list of um, seed stage investors. It's open to founders to use and utilize. You can sign up for that. We also organize pitching events and other support as education and awareness around how to raise. We never charge founders anything as well. So it's all there and, and free to use. So feel free to check it out. And again, like Anthony said, reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. Amazing. Oh, I see yeah. the LinkedIn. Well, yes. Yeah, I've just shared my LinkedIn, uh, but you can also find me on the, you know, the uh, uh, Startup Grind website. My details are there. Uh, I'm, and I'm happy to give an hour to anybody that wants it just to have a chat. I, I do that with, with all the organizations that I'm, I work with, the Princess Trust, I'm a STEM ambassador, a Digital Property Alliance ambassador. I like to give some time back to startup businesses. And if you're especially in the big data field, you know, uh, you know, uh, Web3, NFT, blockchain, all this kind of stuff or deep tech and need some kind of help, just reach out. You know, I've been doing tech for 40 years. <laughs> if I haven't experienced that, then I'll, what, 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 what I'm doing. <laughs> thank you. And thank you All very right. much for inviting us. And nice to see you guys, Anthony. And, and, and hopefully and, we'll and see likewise. you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. very much. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. I would like uh, all the attendees uh, to check our website. We have two more amazing events uh, leveling up north next week. Uh, one on blockchain NFTs at the heart of Web3 with the startup pitch competition. And then we do have a special guest like today. Um, uh, it's um, the former chief of staff to Jeff Bezos uh, on the 7th of April. So please, it's an online session if anyone's interested about, uh, you know, scaling up a tech business building technology, please do tune in. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and so, uh, well, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. For Thank you. Bye.